Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? I am doing better than the Oilers. Mm -hmm. Four losses in a row. And man, this loss was deserved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely deserved. Um, Bruce, you were at the game. I was. What was it like? Yeah, my first uh, game, regular season game. I went to a few exhibition games this year, but... Uh, my first regular season game, and I'm seeing a team with uh, a lot of warts right now, man. Uh, but what I also saw was um, just, you know, the the fun experience of being at the game. You know, I mean, this was a this was a very loud game because he had two competing groups of fans that were more or less equally split. Man, there was a lot of Leaf fans, and of course, they started getting louder as the game went along. But it just started off at such a, a you know, a pell-mell pace. There was, you know, big hits and and just speed and excitement. And, and you know, it just felt like hockey in Canada. Like it was a, you know, Saturday night, Toronto, Edmonton. And the way the way it kicked off was, was a, a lot of fun. And I uh, had uh, very good seats, uh, courtesy of a friend who was too sick to go. So feel better, Blaine. And... In the meantime, uh, uh, it, it was enjoyable, but it was still, and it was a date night for me and my wife. I mean, was that? But anyway, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, it, it grew increasingly frustrating as the Oilers struggled to uh, make plays. Man, they were had Toronto was just all over them. Man, the the, the four check of Toronto, and the Oilers couldn't handle it. And the first period, they kept turning the puck over inside their own blue line, or not even turning it over. Toronto would just take it away from them, or you know, force the bad pass. And uh, it was uh, kind of one-way traffic on Mikko Koskinen there for a while. I thought the Oilers did have some good shifts um, mm -hmm. as the game went on. Each line actually had a few good moments on the forecheck, mm -hmm. and the Oilers could have easily tied this game um, up. You just can't keep getting behind though two nothing and and um, you know this was not on Miko Koskinen. Who he, no, he, he in, 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 the both first goals came not on the first grade A chance, but they were like the the second chance in the first sequence, and then the third grade A chance. Like the the first chance in the first sequence was like a like a you know five alarm triple A chance. He made a ten bell save to my eye. I still haven't seen a replay of it, but it looked like from yeah. where I was behind Koskin, it looked like an unbelievable save. And I was waiting for the whistle to give him a big hand. Of course, the puck was in the net before the whistle ever came. Second goal, the same thing, Bruce. It was uh, he, he made a great save on the second shot. Anyway, let's move on to our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast because we're going to deal with all that. What was your good thing? Uh, I'm going to go with Edmonton's one goal, and uh, what I liked about it was the a little bit of deception. How they've they've uh, they've sold and sold and sold again this play where um, they come through the neutral zone kind of at half speed, and then McDavid winds up all the way from behind his own net, and he comes charging up the ice at light speed. And Drysaddle typically is the one who hits him, sometimes cleft bomb with the drop pass, and McDavid comes zooming up the ice on the zigzag, and he gains his own. And Toronto was kind of looking for that, and Leon was kind of looking back for uh, for Connor, and all of a sudden, wham, he lead, makes his perfect pass up to the right wing where speedster Alex Chason is hanging out on the old sleeper play, and he's behind everybody, and he's got just enough room that he can squeeze in behind, and he kind of loses his balance on the way in, but he somehow manages to swat the puck, goalie, everything, and thing dribbles into the net. But I just like the concept of the play. It's nice to have something up your sleeve when the other team is looking for something. Hey, bam, take this. And it went, you know, it was in the net within about three seconds of the actual um, yeah. great pass. And, and it was, uh, but it was, that was a set play, I'm sure of it. And I, I loved it. Should have done that against Carolina, or maybe the Carolina game was a signal that something had to change because Carolina was getting on them in the neutral zone, yes. waiting for it. And so good, wait, a strong adaptation if that was indeed a set play. And I'm, I'm assuming you're right, Bruce. Although Dry Soto could easily conjure up magic on his own. But um, yeah, if you're if they're going to just do that, then you just take it outside, make that look for that play now and then. And and now, now they have to be honest. Now they're afraid of that play. Do that two or three times and. Uh, no. And they'll stop doing that. Okay, my good thing, Bruce, was um, uh, the 
pairing of Oscar Clefbaum and Adam Larson, who I thought um, maybe had their best game of the year, and that's coming off a strong game. Larson played 24-43. Clefbaum mm-hmm. played 28-11. Um, most of that was at even strength for both players. And they were – Larson um, – it's great to see this actually because mm-hmm. I was a little worried about him yeah, um, a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming off the injury, though, it took him a while to get back, but he is now moving his feet. He's kind of, you know, kind of dancing out there on his skates a little bit, moving extremely well, passing the puck. He's, he uh, was involved in at least one grade A chance. I think he set up Kara for a one timer shot in the second mm-hmm. period. Oscar Kleffbaum got off two dangerous one timers from the outside in the third. They were just really, really strong. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I know there's a lot of people right now who are kind of down and, and we're a little bit down, you know, the orders have lost four in a row. The team is now 18 and 17, but I don't see this as the same team as last year's team. Um, what they need is both pairs of defense to be playing well at the same time. Their top okay. two pairs. They haven't had that. So now, now that uh, Larson and uh, Clefbaum are playing well, nurse and bear are um, doing something bad in the bed. That's, they were struggling. I, they were struggling under that the, sounded a little uh, bit weird. the pressure tonight, weren't they? Bruce, they were terrible, yeah. and um, they really were. And uh, I think it's their second. Ethan Bear's in a little bit of a defense. He's in a defensive slump now. So Clefbaum just got over one, and now Bear's headed into one. So this is this, of course, is going to happen. And um, and um, but Clefbaum, uh, he's he's been he's been I think a good defenseman this year looking for a good partner to pair up with. And he, I think Larson can be that player. He has been that player. If he can stay healthy and keep playing this well, this is the player that had the vast majority, actually, of Oilers fans thinking the Oilers didn't do bad in the Taylor Hall trade that first year. This is the Adam Larson. This is how he played when yeah. most Oilers fans felt that way, including us, that the Oilers got a win out of that trade. New Jersey might have got a win out of that trade, but so did the Oilers because of Taylor Hall's, or excuse me, because of Adam Larson's play that year. He, if he can keep playing like this and stay healthy, if Baron Nurse can turn it around, then the Oilers are going to turn it around, I think. But um, um, they, well, they're going to need uh, some... Uh, go ahead. I was sitting behind the Oilers net for two of the three periods, uh, directly looking over Koskinen's shoulder right up the ice. And uh, uh, to me, Adam Larson in particular stood out all night uh, certainly in the first and third periods when, like, you know, he he was a tower of power out there in my eye. He was winning battles, but he was he was uh, involved in getting, doing stuff with the puck and jumping into the play and moving the puck. You know, he had four shots on net and six shot attempts in this game. Like, he was involved in the offensive part of the game. And he doesn't have a great shot, and you know, uh, but he's trying to activate and get involved in the in the cycle more. And in his own end, he was winning the puck and he was making plays to get it out of the zone, which is more than we were seeing from the other two pairs. Yeah, when he's when he's uh, moving well in the offensive zone, because he has a fairly good offensive mind in a way, he knows when to jump in the play and when not to. And um, like he's he's not much worse than Darnell Nurse, honestly. Like Nurse, um, Nurse doesn't doesn't have I I wouldn't say like great offensive instincts, so he'll often take a shot from outside that'll kill a good attack. Or he'll make a bad pass, and he did tonight, right? And this great, great pressure, and he shoots at forty-five. Uh, and, uh, yeah, like no, with no one in front of the net, right? Yeah. So, so you know, you know, neither of them are great offensive players, but I think they're both at least adequate offensive players. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe, maybe, av- maybe average, maybe a little bit when they're both playing well, maybe a little bit ab- above average. So that's what we saw from Larson tonight. What was your bad thing or thing? Oh. My bad thing tonight was the performance of Edmonton's big three up front. Uh, I don't think they uh, any of them had a very good game. Uh, I don't think they brought it offensively or defensively, to tell the truth. Uh, Nuge had one excellent back check that saved a dangerous rush. Yeah, but it's all, worse, yeah. all three of the big three uh, made a you know was a defensive culprit on one of the goals against, and they just didn't make enough happen at the other end. You know, between the three of them. Uh, they were only involved in two grade-A scoring chances. That's a terrible low number for those guys. One each for McDavid and Drysaddle in the whole game, none for Nuge. Uh, this is your count, but I trust it. because I'll check it, but it might be off by one, you know, but it won't yeah. be off by, by much. 
And against uh, those same three players, 10 grade A scoring chances against. And they should have a solid plus uh, playing forward. And, and they're getting burned. And, you know, it wasn't just the, the chances. It was the whole possession shot. You know, the, the first line of McDavid, uh, Dreisaitl, and Cassian, when they were on the ice, the Oilers were outshot 19-7. to 7. And they weren't exa- who were they out against? I mean, nineteen to seven. Well, Jared Hall, I think a seven hundred thousand dollar defenseman or whatever he is, and he played twenty six minutes for Toronto. Lost a top defenseman in the first early going of the game, and they just weren't really able to take advantage. And and a lot of the reason was they were stuck in their own end of the ice. And and I'm I'm just not seeing David the commitment to the 200-foot game. And if these guys want to be contenders and champions in their career, they've got to figure this out. They've got to figure this out. I mean, the play on the second goal where, I mean, the Oilers are, are running around in their own end and then uh, uh, Dreisaitl and Cassian are both coming back and then they just both peel away when the puck is going right to the front of the net. And they wind up with two Toronto guys and no Oilers in front of the net because the defensemen are lost at sea. And it winds up the guy pounds at home with nobody around him, like easy goal. I don't know what Leon thought, where he thought the puck was going to come out, that he was going to get a chance to go the other way. But he needs to realign his thinking to... We're going to get the puck back. I'm going to have to go back there and, and get it because otherwise they're going to score. I mean, you got to recognize the danger. It was an obvious, like, panic station. Get collapse in the front of the net and make a play. I don't know what Bruce? is with him, honestly, Bruce. Like, seriously, Dreisaitl's got to get his... He's got to get it together as a defensive player. He is just... That was... His play today was atrocious on defense. He was atrocious. He was lucky he was just the goat on one goal. It could have been three or four. There was a play in the first period. Mitch Marner moves in to the slot area, gets off a shot, and Dreisaitl is with Tavares all the way to the net, and suddenly Dreisaitl's peeling off, peeling off up the ice, and who's in front of the net to score, uh, to get a grade A, you know, a very de- Tavares. And then exactly the same thing. It could, And it couldn't be more obvious on the play, like who is F1? Who's supposed to be playing center there? It's Dreisaitl. He's the only forward back. He's the deep forward in front of the net. On both of those plays, instead of stopping in the net and covering a man, he peels off up the ice. I mean, this is just, it's just, what is he thinking? He, I don't know. He, like, I don't, I don't know. like that, to that go on about, goal, like, you're making $8.5 million a year, like, get your head out of your butt, but get your head out of your butt. Start to play defensive <laughs> hockey. Like, just, yeah. and listen, okay, well, Nugent yeah. Hopkins on the first one, Bruce. Mm-hmm. What is he doing? How many times have I seen Nuge standing in the slot beside the player and not taking his stick? He has got to get aggressive in the defensive mm-hmm. slot and take that guy's stick. That should never be a goal. He shouldn't be able to get that shot off. But you have Nugent Hopkins, puck watching. Puck comes right to the guy he should be covering, taking his stick. He's standing right next to him, and the guy gets his gets the shot off. So I'm a little bit... I was... I am very frustrated right now with the defensive play of those two pit players in particular because it's not the first time in the last few games that Nuge has made that mistake or Dreisaitl, and they've got to stop making those mistakes or the Oilers are going to keep losing. And there's no reason they should be losing. They're not, they're, not getting, they're not getting thumped by better teams in these games. They're losing a bunch of close games because the other team's getting double-A chances when they can only themselves manage grading, and they're double-A chances because the Oilers' top attackers are slacking off on defense. Well, when your first line, uh, you know, your 20 plus million dollar line is getting out shot 19 7 and getting out scored 2 0, uh, your chance of winning that game are pretty close to zero. And, you know, it's, it, they weren't getting it done offensively. I mean, tonight, uh, McDavid had one shot in the entire game. Drysaddle had two. Uh, Nuge had two. In the meantime, you got guys like. Jujar Kara and Adam Larson and Oscar Kleffbaum with four shots on net. And you look at their final shots total and it looks great, but it wasn't, you know, not their grade A shooters getting grade A shots. It was just shots. And they're, uh, uh, they're top. this was a funny game, you know, because there was a lot of star power in this game with uh, Toronto as well. And Matthews and uh, Tavares, uh, generated, you know, no goals, no points, and uh, Marner's got an empty net goal. But you look at it, well, look at that. Tavares had five shots, and Matthews had five shots. Like, they were, you know, at least making stuff happen and getting pucks to the net. And our first line just lost the battle, and I frankly, I saw Zach Cassian very bad in this game also. It's just very poor puck management. And uh, he coughed the puck up. Um, 
once, once just before the second goal, and again, just under, not under pressure, and he just kind of made a poor play with it, and then twice before the third goal, once he tried to stick handle out of his own end along the boards, and he got checked, and then he got the puck back, and he tried to pass it to dry settle on the right wing, and he put it like 15 feet behind him, and Toronto just came, picked it off, and came back with another wave, and the the the, the management of the puck is is an issue and it's you know the star players are part of that issue but it's not just those guys and uh, they, they've got uh, they got some work to do and you know Dave Tippett's got some coaching to do like he's got to coach that into these guys I mean you start to wonder after a while when they've had three very experienced NHL coaches working with these guys and you still see these you know almost rookie mistakes well, I wonder, Bruce, if it's the, you know, and I've talked about this before with Drysaddle, he doesn't know what position he's playing. Like, is he a center or a winger? And um, they're constantly shifting in the defensive zone. And he, and he's play, he played both of those two plays. Like, Cassian peeled off. Well, he's the winger. He, that's okay. You peel off, you cover the defense. But the center doesn't peel off. He doesn't fly. He's not going elsewhere. He's, he's there in front of the net helping the goalie. And I just wonder if Drysaddle doesn't understand um, that he's that's his role, that's his job. Like, well, so you know, certain plays, it doesn't almost matter what position you play, you got to recognize the danger man. I mean, you can say, Well, I covered too. my point guy, and the guy in front was left alone and he scored. You can go to the guy in front and try and check the guy. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I choose door number two. Gagne also, Gagne also made a really bad play on the first goal. I don't know if you noticed it, but uh, on the first, that first really ter- uh, dangerous, dangerous chance that Toronto had that was a cross seam pass. It's because Gagne had fl- blown the zone looking for a pass, and his man was wide open to make that pass down yeah, low. I'll watch for that. Now, now, Sam Gagne has been playing solid defensive hockey, so I didn't bring him up in this context because he's not in the same boat right now as as, as those other guys in that they're consistently making mistakes. Drysaddle's in a horrendous slump right now um, defensively, and not so much offensively, but somewhat offensively, but definitely defensively. And I yeah. And again, I think... They're going to have to figure this out. I don't know. I just think stick him at center on the second line, but maybe, I don't know, they, they, they need him to score too, so it's a tough, this is he the problem. He was playing at such a level for the first six or eight weeks that he was bound to drop off, but I'm, I'm, I'm disturbed by how much of a cliff it seems to be in terms of his, as you say, you know, the, the, the two-way game has, has really suffered. Okay, your number. Okay, my, uh, my number is uh, 12 and 24, and that is goals. In the last six Oilers home games, I'm only going back two weeks, and this was a part of the season where the Oilers, they came home off a 3-2 and two road trip, and they had a great chance to make some hay. And they came home, and they got whooped 5-2 by Vancouver. Then they went and won in Vancouver. Then they came home, and they got whooped 5-2 by Ottawa. Then they they edged the Kings two to one, and then they lost to the Sabers three to two in a in a shootout, and then they got whooped six three by Carolina, and then they went on the road and lost, and then they came back home and they got whooped four one by Toronto. So the last six home games, one win, one Bettman point, four losses by three goals each, twelve goals for twenty four against. Like you know, they're getting whooped at both ends of the ice, and overall the last nine games, which is those six plus three road games. 23 4 and uh, no, sorry, 21 4, 36 against, and five of the nine games I lost by three goals. And then, wow. uh, all the other going games were close, but the, you know, half their games are getting caved. It's not good. It's oh, not good. No, it is not I wonder good. if they're going to go back with Koskin and again, I would for the next game. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I, I play Smith in one of the back to backs next weekend, is the only game that he plays for Christmas if if they're going off of the record of the two goalies and, and yeah. we'll see how uh, Tippett hands look like they play every other day and then uh, they play the 20th, 21st and Smith is sure to play one of those games and he should, but uh, if he, and if he can, can, I was actually thinking about this. We talked about last game, how they're locked in and uh, I was wrong about one thing. Apparently I, I was saying, thinking Smith had a no move contract. He had a no trade contract. But there's nothing in there, as I understand it now, that he can't be sent down to the minors if they get another goalie. So that does change the equation because, I mean, he's been, I mean, we, we talked this to death last night, last time. There's no point in a game he didn't play other than to say, at this point in time, the Oilers, uh, you know, the two-man goaltending system is uh, uh, 
I mean, 36 goals against in nine games. It's a four goals against average. And I mean, some of it's defense, but some of it's goaltending. All right. My number, Bruce, is, and I'm glad you clarified that because uh, it's good to get it right, I guess. Um, my number, are, my numbers are 958 and 938. That's the amount of ice time for C- Caleb Jones and Chris Russell, respectively. The third pairing didn't get a lot of ice time. They were part of the uh, sequence of pain on the first goal against. <laughs> Russell took one off the ankle and fell. I was wondering, why are you lying on the ice? Like, why Why is that player lying on the ice? I couldn't figure it out at, initially. In the, but you could see he took one off the ankle. And then Caleb Jones allowed the pass out into the slot, which Ryan Nugent Hopkins allowed for the shot on net. But that's also on Jones. I mean, he's supposed yeah. to oh, stop yeah. that pass. Oh, yeah, it was pretty soft coverage. I had a real good view yeah. of that. He was he, just beat. Yeah, the so... Way. Otherwise, they played okay, though. Um, it uh, looks like that was interesting how little they played. I was when I saw that in the when I saw that in the third period, you know, you know uh, I was wondering because because I, I uh, watched the game after it was over, so I knew their time on ice, and I was thinking, oh, did Russell get hurt this game? But no, he just didn't. Well, maybe when he hurt his ankle, maybe there was. Uh, well, maybe maybe yeah. that's it because. Uh, that's a little bit low, even. Nine thirty-eight. I don't remember the last time Chris Russell played under ten. Minutes they were. I thought hurt. they were fine as the rest of the game went on. So, um, I I do think that the Oilers. What, what separates the Oilers from last year's team fundamentally are three things. I think that they have uh, faster forwards in the bottom six, which allows them to forecheck more, and to mm. kill penalties better. So we saw actually a, a fairly sustained forecheck at times from each of the the two bottom lines. The kind of line in particular had three two tremendous lines. long shifts in, in, in the end yeah. in front of me. In well, the Neil, Neil and uh, Gagne, oh, that's oh. the second line, though. But And Gaetan Haas had another great deflection where he almost scored. So so that's number one. Number two is the 6D. They've got at least 6D you can play with. Matt Benning, they have seven. So I think that they're. this is a major difference in last year's team. And the final one is I think Mikko Koskinen is for real. I, 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 I'm... I've seen enough of him this year. If he's not overplayed like he was last year, I think they have a real goalie. They have a starting goalie who can play about 50 to 55 games and is going to give you a chance to win um, a lot of those games. So there's three big differences um, from last year's team, and hopefully that'll be enough to uh, actually make a difference in the standings. Um, So I, I think that the small amount of ice time that Russell and Jones got was some kind of anomaly, maybe explained by uh, Russell if he was to get hurt. And the fact they were trailing for you know for the yeah. last fifty five minutes of the game, and that's uh, and they didn't have any penalties to kill until so late that they actually put offensive players on the one penalty kill, and so there there was uh, they stayed out of the box until two minutes left. Or is it just anyway. it just strikes me that I didn't do my bad thing? Did I? Uh, Oh, I'm not sure that you did. We talked about uh, we talked about the three forwards, and we kind of both hashed, pounded away at them. Yeah, them. that's right. We were that was like yeah. so many bad things. But okay, and I, Ethan Bear's mistakes in some ways were different than than um, the mistakes being made by the forwards. Although in a way, not <laughs> the mistakes by Drysaddle and and Nuge are just major mental errors. Now you could say Bear getting caught in the neutral zone. He's starting to get beat by speed down the side mm-hmm. of the rink. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is my, always my concern about the player. But I do think he, he does have the speed. He's just, I think, trying to force things a little bit much right now and not playing conservatively quite enough. He's still making really good plays with the puck. But, I mean, he, he had a super rough night tonight. There's just no sure. other way of putting it. He, let me just go down the, the list here of uh, goals against. Well, so three uh, goals, right? Yeah, so he's caught up ice on the second goal. He's beat by Freddie Gauthier to the net on the third goal, and then he turns over the puck on the empty net goal. So that's, again, these, the, the, both the second and the third one are kind of like, he's not the fastest NHL hockey player, and, but his skating, he showed for the first 30 games, his skating is there. He can skate at the NHL level. He's got to, he's got to be a little bit more conservative, I think, is what's going on right now, but I'm not sure about that. Well, Toronto, to my eye, they really attacked Edmonton's defense, especially in the early going, and they went after those two rookies, and they went after, um, I thought, Darnell Nurse a little bit, and on the, just on the hard, hard forecheck, and 
and Edmonton couldn't handle it. It wasn't just the D either, the forwards, some of the forwards, they just, they, they'd have the puck on their stick and there'd be a guy right on them right away and, and, and they'd make a pass behind someone or, you know, they just would never get any flow going out of their own end. And often that would turn it over and Toronto would get a really good chance out of it. And it was, uh, they were vulnerable in that aspect for I, sure. Yeah. I do see Ethan Bear pulling out of it. I think this is, so. It's the, the, one of the really interesting things about doing the scoring chance project over the years has been, you know, there's all this talk about scoring streaks in hockey, about point mm-hmm. streaks and about players getting hot on the attack. And because we have points, which are actually a, a fairly good way, they've always been a fairly good way of keeping track of players' offensive contribution. Hot, yeah. So we've always been aware of hot streaks on the attack, but mm-hmm. because there's no equivalent on, uh, for defense, um, we've never really been aware of defensive slumps, but over the years, what I've seen with, with our scoring chance project is suddenly a player who is making maybe one major mistake per game on a great a chance against, which is passable for an NHL defenseman suddenly he's starting to make two or three a game and it'll last for five to 10 games. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing that. I think Ethan bears in one of these horrible moments right now. And so these defensive slumps are real and players go through them. And the, the key is, can he pull out of it? Yes, I think he can because he played for a stretch of 50. He's played for a, a couple stretches of 10 games each where he's been really solid defensively. So he just needs to get back into that groove on defense, figure it out, and um, make better decisions. He needs to make some better decisions when when he's uh, covering players in the neutral zone, and this problem's going to go away. Yeah, well, I've been worried a little bit that at some point he's hit the wall because, you know, the, the, playing the games at the rate that they do every other day and him playing 20, 22 minutes a night yeah. after night after night, that at some point it was, you know, there was going to be some cliff diving happening. And, I mean, we talked about this with Drysaddle earlier, but, uh, I mean, Bear is not at that point, but tonight's game is pretty worrisome that he, uh, he, he looked out of his element and that empty net goal. Mind you, when you got three forwards all standing at the far blue line, it kind of reduces your <laughs> as, your uh, passing options just a tad. But, uh, to see Too bad, him Matt. miss a ten foot pass is not what you expect from Ethan Bear. That's the strength of his game. That's for sure, Bruce. Um, if Matt, it's it's a sh- such a shame that Benning is hurt. You know, just on its own account because he is a good hockey player. You don't want to see anyone get hurt, especially a concussion. Uh, but just for the team's sake as well, he, he was playing his best hockey and there's a chance he could have stepped up, you know, if, Be- if Benning or if, excuse me, if Bear needed a rest, you know, go to mm-hmm. the third pairing for a couple games. Yeah. Um, he could have got that maybe with Benning moving up to play with nurse, but that's not, doesn't seem to be in the cards although. And, and of course, you know, the injuries, uh, they're so opaque now. We don't know when he's coming back. Do we? We have right. no idea. We don't really have any no, idea. I don't think they have. Maybe they idea. don't. Yeah, actually, Tippett's pretty good. He's much better than uh, concussion, though. I mean, some some you don't know when the guy's headache goes away until it goes away. That's right. And, I mean, we don't, I haven't heard any details, but uh, yeah. I know he went out with that, you know a head injury twice in two weeks after Evander Kane clubbed him, and then he comes back finally. In the first game back, he gets hit in the head with a shot. I mean, yeah, tough luck, schlep rock there. Tippett is pretty good, actually, about giving information. But like you say, like a concussion, who knows? Nobody knows when it's going to clear up. And All right, Bruce, we should leave it there for tonight. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Yes, thank you. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.